Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is an absolute pleasure for me to moderate this latest um, keynote from an esteemed member and friend of the surgical robotic community. And today we have the honor and privilege to hear um, the latest work from my friend and colleague, Sanya Dogramazzi, who is professor of medical robotics and research director at the Department of Automatic Control and Systems Engineering at the University of Sheffield. Following her PhD in medical robotics from the University of Newcastle, Sanya moved to Leeds as a research fellow before landing at the University of the West of England, where she eventually became the healthcare robotics group lead at the BRL, Bristol Robotics Laboratory, a post she held jointly with the University of Bristol, where she was professor until her recent move to Sheffield. Sanya has over 20 years of experience in surgical and physical assistance robots, safe human robot interaction, and safe robotics, and her research interests include design and control of surgical robots um, for minimally invasive fracture surgery, which is something we share, and robot-assisted MIS, rehabilitation robots, and safe and ethical human-robot interaction. She has led many research projects, both in the UK and in the European Union, and is currently the coordinator and PI of the Horizon 2020 funded Smart Search, which she's going to tell us about shortly. She's also a member of the BSI ISO standardization initiative for medical robots and has won numerous accolades, notably the Bristol and Bath Health and Care Award for her achievements in robotic assisted robotic or, uh, orthopedic surgery, which is an area that is close to both of our hearts. Without further ado, I am delighted to introduce her talk, which is entitled Smart Search, Wearable Systems and uh, Anthropomorphic Tools for Surgical Teleoperations. Sanya, you may now share your screen. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ferdinando, for, for the lovely introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to talk today. Um, as I said, as you rightly point out, I uh, have moved from Bristol Robotics Lab, where I spent a lovely 14, 15 years uh, working on medical robotics. So I moved to University of Sheffield Faculty of Engineering, and I will just tell you a little bit about the place where I am right now before I move to the talk. So Faculty of Engineering is, is an established faculty. This is a world top, um, one of the top uh, universities, has strong partnership with large companies um, in the, such as Rolls-Royce, Airbus. Uh, it features Advanced Manufacturing Research Center, which is the government catapult, which is the uh, you know, the uh, diamond in, in the crown of, of Sheffield and has also strong partnerships with local hospitals and medical device companies. Here I'm in the Department of Automatic Control, one of the best control and system engineering centers in the world. And um, within there, we have, of course, Automatic Control and System Engineering Robotics Group. Uh, and um, uh, medical robotics is just one of the areas. So we have uh, uh, fantastic research in verifiable autonomy, uh, in cooperative robots, in multi-agent autonomous systems and human robot interaction. Uh, this is uh, a Sheffield robotics group. So you probably recognize some of these uh, friendly faces. Um, and healthcare robotics is, is something that has been built for the last five years in, in um, AXI and um, um, really striving to become a center for biomedical robotics in UK and wider. So we have a strong team working in uh, surgical robotics, in rehabilitation, um, in uh, brain implants, for instance, in bio-inspired robots uh, for surgery, endoscopy, and, and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, surgical robotics challenges. So um, ultimately, um, the, the, the community, not just uh, not just medical robotics, but wider robotics communities, is striving to achieve uh, automation and autonomy. Um, this is a challenging thing. It, it is uh, particularly challenging for surgical robotics, and um, there is nothing more uh, challenging uh, than a constantly changing environment, which we all, um, uh, which most of the robots will, uh, of course, encounter in in surgery. So the, the, we are working on this um, uh, continuum between teleoperation and no human input 
um, and our research fits into in somewhere here. Um, but on that path, uh, there, there, there are so many problems that they're still um, you know, waiting to be solved. So uh, working across different applications in surgery, there are of course many things that, uh, many problems that, that, can, that are shared. So one, first of all, it, it is about the instruments. So talking about minimal invasive surgery, whether it's, we are talking about orthopedics and, and uh, fracture surgery, it is precision. It is that the surgeons need precision and they need precision manipulation. They need a good reachability and they need instruments to be um, uh, correctly controlled. Um, moving on from, from instrumentation, um, the next is vision and touch and, and that, that is again shared among all applications. So in minimal invasive surgery, this travel from 2D in laparoscopy to 3D now to, to enhance 3D division, um, where we have image overlays, with, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about that, what we achieved in smart search um, in this area. It is about touch as well. The touch is lost, obviously. So how the surgeons estimate grasp and pull forces, how they estimate how stiff is the tissue, where they should cut, where they should touch is, is still um, a problem. It is, of course, the training time as well. So they they all the surgeons go through open surgery training, they move then to robotic or laparoscopic surgery. So what we offer to them uh, in medic, from medical device community and medical robotics community, is something that has to be learned quickly, it has to be intuitive, it has to be easy to use, and it has to allow them situational awareness. So they should be aware of what is there that they see as almost as much as if they um, are completely inside. And of course, the safety. So the safety is ultimately uh, the most important thing in, in, in hospital, in medical environment. So in surgery, particularly about preserving sensitive and healthy areas, understanding tissue dynamics, limiting forces, and then improving human robot interfaces um, in order to achieve um, a better surgery, more accurate surgery, the surgery that will actually save uh, and save tissue as, as much as deliver um, and remove what shouldn't be there. So this is why we, uh, for many of these reasons, we set up smart wearable robotic teleoperated surgery or smart surge. And um, you can see here, this is uh, what we submitted to Humbling Surgical Robotic Challenge. Uh, so I just picked up the screenshot from there. And here is the list of the partners. So there are 10, 10 partners, University of the West of England or myself have been acting as a coordinator. And out of these 10 partners, we have four uh, clinical uh, partners uh, from different disciplines. So um, we set up to develop um, situational awareness and safety. And uh, most of all, we started with a wearable, uh, a wearable system for uh, controlling instruments that have higher dexterity than they currently have with haptic feedback and active constraints as additional safety features. So this is what you can see at the top left corner. So, um, um, left uh, below that is, is our comparison with the existing Da Vinci system where um, we are uh, we envis we envisage to have smart glasses, so the glasses that can be worn by the surgeon anywhere in the room, uh, that can actually have a projected surgical um, uh, surgical um, area, but also overlays and complex images that can be all projected on the smart glasses. Our slave manipulator, our envisioned with more dexterity than Da Vinci ca currently has, and most of all, we have then. Um, a system that can control all this dexterity um, inside the, the human body um, in the surgery. So this has been driven by three surgical specialisms. So uh, there are several surgeons, I didn't put all of them here, but basically these are three surgical specialists, urology, it is um, knee surgery, atroposty, and uh, cardiovascular surgery. So all these three group of surgeons uh, have contributed uh, to um, the requirements uh, for the project development. So in the summary, uh, so we uh, collected information and inputs from about 40 surgeons in these three different specialties in the, in the first year of the project. So 
um, we, what we try to do is to actually have the clinical need to push technology development rather than the technology actually then is somehow pushed towards uh, the clinicians. So what we defined there um, was uh, that surgeons would like to know what forces they use in, when they are doing surgery. Um, they would like to have increased enhanced safety and visualization, visualization through active constraints, so no-go regions that preserve sensitive areas, to have enhanced vision, uh, meaning that, that we can have pre-operative images together with the, the, the intraoperative images, and the dexterity and, tele, and, and enhanced master um, is something that they would like to, to explore uh, because they, they thought that this is something that can contribute to the way how they operate. So all this has been published um, up to the first year and uh, you, can, you can have a look. There's quite a lot of information that we collected from surgeons. So on the dexterity anthropomorphic master, um, we developed um, now anthropomorphic instruments. So this is a wearable hand controller. It has three uh, fingers, which re resemble thumb and index and middle finger. Um, and um, so this is the, our basic concept of wearable that we explored. And then on top of that, we look at the further extending dexterity, but we then did that through the virtual reality. Um, and we explore that in different concepts and compare uh, to a user study. So our wearable system, um, at some point we thought it could, would be actually very interesting if we can um, collect the data and see if we can um, learn the hand motion that actually drive different types of instruments. So it doesn't matter as long as we know the way how they would drive the instrument, they can drive whatever instrument they like. So, so it's not that for each different type of instrument, you need to have a particular master. And then another stream was sensorless force sensing. So for that, we thought, OK, um, having sensors directly in the instruments is really difficult. Can we actually go to the data-driven model um, and use data-driven methodology uh, to explore this? And finally, we did some study in palpation and haptic feedback. Um, on the safety and visualization was performed by, by my partner, by partners on the project in Polimi and, and CERT in Greece. Uh, so here this we developed, uh, they developed um, uh, augmenting reality toolkit and interoperative reconstruction, um, and also augmented reality enhanced graphic user interface uh, with active dynamic constraints. So active dy dynamic constraints are actually featuring, so they were developed by CERT and then implemented on uh, GUI developed by Polini. So wh why we uh, thought that there is a need for hand-like instrument in surgery? So um, retraction and manipulation of delicate tissues is, is obviously has been a problem. Uh, so moving particular pi part of the tissue in order to access something which is underneath is, is currently performance. It's performed on a very um, small, uh, contact point where which actually produce very large forces on on what is grasped on the tissue. The other thing is looking at how and what they manipulate. And one thing we can we can observe is the way uh, and how they perform suturing and knotting. And and then you can see that actually they do in open surgery they would use um, three fingers. They would use just two fingers as they have to do now as they, um, on, a, on a Da Vinci instrument. So how much this can improve their, uh, some of their basic, very basic, basic um, uh, movements that they, they do over and over again during one course of surgery. And of course, this hand assisted laparoscopy. So here is where they actually have manipulation and retraction of large organs by actually allowing one hand inside the abdomen. So, where we started from, the Vinci robot instruments and the traditionally forceps are two finger only. So these are with different types, whether it's a scissor or it's, it's, it's just grasping the tissue. But there have been attempts in the past on multi-finger surgical tools, one particularly on the ocular robotic surgery um, for removing um, a layer on the eye uh, by actually having much better distributed forces as was the idea that we started with. Um, with the multi-finger um, hand here, 
The other one was another attempt looking at more compliant tree fingers that can actually, again, produce distributed forces on, on the soft tissue that they, that they are grasping. So we decided, um, I thought about how, what would be the best way to design 3F uh, instrument. We look at um, optimal um, indexes, or so optimization. So one is force capability index. The other one is looking more, at, one is looking more at the force capability, the other one more at the dexterity. So these particular, these indexes are used in uh, understanding uh, dexterity or parallel mechanisms. So through the optimization, we wanted to decide what is the, uh, uh, really the ratio of the fingers that we would need to, to manufacture to, that would be the best for, for grasping. So use the Pareto optimizer and came up with the right ratio of the fingers. So this is our three finger tool. Uh, in the course of the project, uh, we created two. It, is, um, in, it has six degrees of freedom. So each finger has two degrees of freedom and they are not easy to make. Uh, they were all uh, basically manually produced. Um, uh, they are cable driven and um, they, we, first of all, we tested our uh, teleoperation on a, um, through ROS and, and um, um, after that, uh, when we we actually created this, uh, we have um, looked at uh, the actual teleoperation um, of this using uh, a chain of IMUs uh, that we were tracking in real time in order to control opening and closing of this. So this is uh, the close up of the instrument. It is um, as long um, as, as a Da Vinci instrument. It has three finger at the end and it is driven uh, by six uh, Maxon motors in um, control um, in real time. So this is the tracking system. So this is IMU based. Uh, we have um, uh, 13 sensors where we track uh, uh, the thumb index, the middle finger and wrist. Um, and um, we tested this, tested, tested the accuracy using Polaris tool. Uh, we did accuracy assessment um, and came up with the, uh, the errors and standard deviation, which were at the acceptable level. Um, so this is um, uh, then the mapping, uh, mapping between the fingers and the tool. Uh, so we, we performed joint to joint mapping um, by actually uh, first of all, calibrating the glove so the, the, that every user opens and closes. So we get actually the relative um, and range of motion for each user uh, specifically, but then limit also uh, the motion of the fingers uh, of the instrument fingers because um, it has more, uh, of course, the hand has more restriction than the instrument itself. So here is, here is some example of uh, changing, so opening and closing uh, of the two joints on the thumb. Um, as response to uh, 10 degrees uh, change of increase and decrease of um, the finger motion. So first of all, we, we uh, explored, can we use this uh, for the Vinci instrument? So we uh, um, just uh, control the end the wrist uh, in, real, in real time. In this particular video, uh, we looked at um, just using this as a, as a scissors for uh, cutting in a kind of more natural uh, weight for us to actually cut something. Uh, so it was just the middle finger and, um, and index finger that were used to control the Vinci instrument. Um, after this, we, uh, we then look at the Vinci for, uh, so we gave it to surgeon. Uh, the surgeon used that on laparoscopic um, uh, trainer. So here it is uh, where, uh, first of all, the, the surgeon practice to use just the hand. So for them, it is quite unusual. Uh, and then when the hand is attached to haption, which is six degrees of freedom uh, haptic device, um, then it can basically drive the, the uh, KUKA arm uh, and perform uh, these simple tasks just with the hand um, rather than so I think they quite like this idea and the freedom that they can move the hand um, in any direction and that follows. So the similar experiments were then done 
again now with the clav um, retracking and the three finger tool uh, the same uh, type of, of uh, tasks were done um, what we we learned from this is that the surgeons still find uh, da vinci much more effective for simple pick and place tasks uh, the three finger tool for this um, tiny tasks so, so small fine grasping they found too complicated Um, in the next stage, we use the learning hand motion to operate surgical tools. So here we started with Da Vinci and then we moved to uh, Castro Viejo. So this is an instrument that is used in open heart surgery. Um, and because one of the surgeons working with us is a, is a heart surgeon, we, collect, we had a, a period of collecting the data. So uh, this was uh, performed on the ex vivo porcine um, sample. And, and we collected the data during some typical procedures of surgery and cutting and um, generally manipulating the tissue. Um, so in the first instance, uh, we just collected the data, we explored the, the workspace of, of each digit. Um, while on the, the next stage, uh, we actually then tracked uh, the position of Castro Viejo as well of the instrument. So we had a touch polaris tool and strain gauges for opening and closing and the tool generally for general uh, pose of the instrument. So we created uh, two different types of networks um, and use all the joint angles um, of the instrument uh, of the hand um, and, and wrist as inputs and um, outputs. We had the pose of the instrument and opening and closing. So the movements were uh, quite accurately actually predicted. Um, and you can see here the tracking of the surgical instruments so the estimated and real data. Uh, so we had the score training of uh, about 90%, about the same with the prediction time or the processing time, um, actually slightly higher on a long short-term memory um, network. So the, the question here is, is, can we help surgeons to drive their surgical tool irrespective of the scale and type of motion required. So once they learn to, to use their tools, whatever they do, can we just leave them with the tools and they can still use the same, same type of, in, of motion that they would use and still perform. So they don't really have to completely change the paradigm of surgery in their heads. Um, the next, we explored extended, um, in extended um, uh, uh, dexterity. We did that through uh, virtual reality. So here we, we had Accent suit, uh, we had HTC, uh, so VR, and we developed the surgical system in, um, in Unity. So here is the surgeon. Uh, so the first set of experiments, uh, we, um, we used pick and place again, um, and uh, we, we compared different types of tools. So uh, we looked at um, uh, so, uh, different end effectors, so the Da Vinci and three finger tool, and we look at the, the shaft that has just the wrist and the shaft that has wrist and elbow. So when, we did, when they were doing pick and place, we couldn't really see much difference in terms of duration and velocity. So how fast they were performing this um, because actually they found, um, so, so they were controlling this, this um, elbow with their own elbows and wrist with their wrists. And they found this really overly complicated uh, when they were doing this simple pick and place. So the results reflect that. In the next stage, we look at the more complex in, well, surgical environment. So, so we put obstacles there as anatomical features, and we ask them to do um, small tasks by passing this um, around this anatomical structure. But we didn't only record the time they perform, we also record how many of these collisions they have. So, so we had a three different combination of tools. So with, with uh, just the wrist and Da Vinci, with wrist and and elbow, um, and actually the elbow, so you can see here E and 3F mean that the shaft is with elbow and 3F is a three finger tool. They actually have the least collisions and the fastest performing time when we increase dexterity for them and allow them to, eat, to actually get through this um, labyrinth um, easier with more dexterity. 
So actually the first attempt, the surgeons, maybe the time was slightly longer, especially for surgeons who are used to a different type of, of a master device. But then in the second, they, they actually achieved much, much better results uh, with more dexterity. So it, it is how really they adapt to new interfaces that, that we offer to them. Um, in the haptic device, so I've, when talking to, to surgeons, they experience surgeons rely on visual feedback. They really don't often don't like haptic feedback. They don't want it. But there are some types of surgeries because we look through more than just urology where da Vinci is mainly used. And, and for instance, in some like arthroscopy, they need to assess meniscus. And this is something that's very difficult for them. And they cannot rely just on the visual feedback. So we looked at um, can we actually provide something that can give them a feeling of, of that softness that is very close to meniscus. We also did explore um, meniscus uh, uh, properties, so I, I, won't, I don't have time to go into this, but looking at Young's modules or um, a softness of meniscus and something that we can replicate in the system, which is quite challenging. So we had two different types of disruptive feedback, one with, with this variable softness platform and the other one uh, in the next stage we replaced with a simple uh, system of springs uh, in order to create this variable softness um, a, uh, surface. When we explored this uh, with the users, we found out that Actually, it is um, really that these boundaries of, of, um, of softness that, that can be perceived more accurately. Everything that is in between or small differences are much more difficult to be uh, appreciated by, by the uh, participants in this study. Uh, the next stream is sensorless for sensing. So we here explore relationship between the motor current and tool tissue interaction force. So uh, we estimated grasp for, uh, forces uh, from driving the motors of these two uh, independently two jaws of the Da Vinci instrument uh, and created neural network amount to map the ground route. So we had the force sensor there to, to actually measure the force and we picked up uh, motor current forces. Um, so th this, this gave us um, a relatively uh, accurate prediction uh, so basically we created a classifier um, and we used the inputs to the network, the motor current position and velocity and at the output we have this grasping status or rather the force and you can see here um, the, actually the tracking measured forces and predicted forces were um, sufficiently accurate, um, however um, I mean, we trained the data on different softness of the objects. So you can see here at the top, we had the number of different objects and we found the good accuracy of the classifier. Of course, as the instrument itself changes over time, because it is a cable driven instrument, which will change, of course, this relationship will, will, will change. So, so a lot of data is actually required in order to, to make sure that this prediction uh, and the training of data is accurate. Um, so active dynamic constraints. So this is the work done by our colleagues in, um, in Greece uh, at CERT. So this is looking at creating um, active dynamic constraints or repulsion forces around, um, around uh, uh, blood vessels. So this is kidney and the blood vessels. You see the, the yellow is the force that is being applied by the user and the white uh, white uh, areas here are when it is um, as close to the uh, area, sensitive area, then a repulsive force is created. So this is the purple arrow. Um, so operating close to the vessel results in this feeling uh, of repulsive force and the feeling can be or rather the active constraint can be mapped either to uh, the slave or to uh, the master device. Um, and um, as, as it moves now, you can see if it moves closer to the kidney um, and further away from the blood vessels, uh, there will be no repulsive force. So augmented reality. So we, uh, so the colleagues in Polimi and CERT created the graphical user interface that contains critical um, 
information during operation and it has multiple enhanced surgical area with superimposed preoperative information. So I'll see, show you that in the next video. Um, so this is user interface of smart search um, and it is uh, has a 3D reconstruction. First of all, uh, create reconstructing uh, from the model with a lot of um, with a lot of points. Um, it also um, then creates, um, or rather, the, the surgeon can construct virtual constraint on this intraoperative model. So you see the white line where the active uh, the area that has to be avoided. Um, then the active constraint is then published. So all the points are published on the screen um, and that will uh, create the actively, um, the area which will be uh, basically um, affect repulsive forces for the slave. Um, then uh, the preoperative model is used um, and the reg soft registration is pre uh, performed. So uh, this is where the surgeon uh, can also using preoperative model and registration can have image overlays. So actually see the areas where the tumor is and make sure that all the areas are correctly, um, correctly um, cut um, and, and preserved health tissue. So there is some manual um, adjustments that, that can be done also on, on the GUI. So for the exactly accurate positioning now and registration um, and uh, uh, AC is active constraints or active constraint, you can see here, new active constraint is selected immediately. It creates uh, a visible, uh, the area which is um, clear for the surgeon, which part has to be um, avoided. Um, Furthermore, um, as it is uh, due to the, the, the soft registration, these uh, selected areas are updated. You can see the, the yellow um, rectangle, not quite rectangle, but actually it is updated and it moves in each frame as the whole uh, image is, is moving. Um, so you can see here another one. So this is interoperative active constraint path tracking. So it is um, um, being updated as um, the image is, is moving. So I'm coming to uh, the closure. So what next? So this is the, where we perform the current studies. We compare the smart search master system with DaVinci through a series of um, testing. Um, we are also evaluating the efficiency of three finger tool in grasping and retraction and effectiveness of image overlays. So this is where we have um, now um, a number of trials with surgeons to expose them to, to all of this. Um, but the further step is now in um, going through the next project. So this is the funding that uh, has been received by EPSRC on trustworthy autonomous system node on resilience. So this is beyond smart surge where we, we are looking at integrating partial autonomy with teleoperation and implementation of 5G. Um, and ultimate goal is to uh, create safe and resilient HRI toolbox for surgical robotics. So in the discussion points, I think we have augmented reality, um, user-driven master design and partial autonomy to improve in ergonomic features, uh, reduce accidents, speed up, and make assistance surgeons possibly redundant, and also use of data-driven methods uh, for, for estimation of various features. Um, most of all, I'm interested in this mapping surgeons um, to motion learned in open surgeries. So with the idea to simplify, simplify the surgical robotic system um, and simplify the training. Thank you. Wonderful, Sonia. Thank you very much. That was a very, very broad look at a rather complicated multi-center project. Um, I have a, quite a few questions, but um, I'll start with one from our audience, from Ricardo Moradore, who says, great talk, Sonia. Uh, were the ingenious devices you, you, you presented, were, were they requested by surgeons or proposed by, to them by engineers? 
and that makes a huge difference in the exploitation of these technologies within the OR in the near future. So basically, was it a technology push or a clinical pull? Well, some of that was clinical, um, clinical pull. Um, so for instance, especially on, uh, we had a clinical pull on data on uh, wearable system uh, for motion tracking and for learning. So in a way, when we started this, uh, because the robotic system is used mainly from urology, so we had a cardio surgeon and he, he wasn't sure in the beginning how he, he would use anything like this on, you know, they don't use, he doesn't use Da Vinci. Um, and then we, he actually uh, looked at this and said, well, why don't we use this motion? Can, can you track motion of my hand when I'm using us to be a instrument and can you then do the same on the other side so i think in a way that was a very much a clinical um push um i have to say we started with of course we started with the proposal so there was already engineering proposal there and and the proposed method um but you know we didn't have all the requirements when we started so when we started we had a lot of like, more ideas uh, from the surgeons then at the very start of the project. So after the first year, we thought, okay, okay there's so many things we can de develop that we received from them, but we don't have time or capacity to do all of that. Yeah. So I think it's in, in a way it was good um, in the beginning, good exercise in um, requirement analysis. So Sanya, following on from that, so a big chunk of smart search was the haptic component. And so I wonder whether from where you sit and your consortium members. So I, I think from the video, I saw both kinesthetic feedback and kinematic feedback. So basically the one with a manipulator attached to the hand and then the one that acts directly on, on the hand. And I was wondering whether there was an obvious preference from your clinicians as to which one or both or none will be better. And importantly, whether between the urologist, the cardiologist and the orthopedic surgeon, there was a significant difference in opinion, because of course they're very different specialties and having worked with all, it's not always, they're not always aligned. So- No, 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 they're not. And, and I mean, and it, it is expected. I mean, they really have different needs. Um, they go into the different areas. They have different constraints on arthroscopy. Um, of course they, they have bony part and, and they have, a, it's very difficult for them to get around the corners and see things to palpate almost impossible. Yeah. So uh, they, so for instance, urologists, they're not particularly keen on um, haptic feedback from, um, from haption. They are not even so much um, um, interested in, um, in haptic feedback on, on grasping. They would like to know if they're grasping too much, uh, their particular um, tasks that they are interested in. So for instance, uh, they always keep asking me, so we would like to know when this thread is going to, to break because you know, it, it breaks. Can you, can you tell us you know, somehow that it's going to break and then we stop pulling? So they have some, some things that annoy them. However, I think we have to bear in mind that we talk always with experienced surgeons. And for them, a lot of things are already, yeah. oh, how I can do that. And, and it's, it's not like that when they start. So it, it, it's just that, you know, they cannot go back and say, you know, oh, okay, I know how difficult it was. So they want new, something which really annoys them at the, the level where they are. And they're already masters in, in what they are doing. I, and, uh, and, I, uh, and ideally, you'd have a large pool of you know, clinicians with different levels of seniority that you can place in front of a setup and, 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 and probe, which is not always easy and certainly even less easy now that we are in this like, socially distant environment. Mm. And if I take smart search again, which is, so you've got um, an, a, a, an imaging component. So you've got augmented slash virtual reality on one side and then haptics. Was there any consensus as to which one would be more important? And many of us do both. But do you think the future, as seen by the clinicians, has got more augmented reality, more hands-on robotics, or neither of them? Well, I think both, really. Um, I mean, depends who you talk to. 
I mean, they, they would, they like this the vision. I think they, they love that. They want to see more that they can see and, and you can understand why. Uh, so augmented reality, definitely uh, very challenging, very interesting. Did you work with a headset manufacturer or was it just on the screen for the moment? So overlaying virtual and real on screen or also augmented within the, view, the, the viewpoint of the clinician in this project that I wasn't clear of. Um, like a HoloLens style or or that's the well question. we haven't yeah but we haven't got to that point that we test when it is all projected that was the idea so we have uh, a manufacturer of smart glasses um the problem was that when it came to the integration uh, as always i mean you know we had individual components we had good idea of what should come together yeah. But testing is we haven't we haven't done that. But the idea was that you you project this image overlays on on smart glasses. So so based on this experience, do you think any aspect of smart search will progress directly towards a higher level of technology readiness, or is it still foundational? And which basically means you learn the you learn the you learn what to do and what not to do, but the technology needs to go through one iteration of development before somebody can run with it and commercialize or make it available to the wider public. I think we made a, a good research basis to, to take this forward. Well, whether we, I mean, I would like to believe that we have made some, some um, advances towards this wearable system. Uh, so that is on the hardware side, that's what has been developed. Um, obviously, we haven't developed on the hardware or anything else that was all the algorithm. Um, what can have uh, possibly some some more drive is is this uh, data driven methods is but that requires of course a lot more data and a lot more practice and so on. So of course it, it needs another iteration. It's none of that is is TRL six. I mean I would say probably TRL four. Max. And I think that's the uncanny valley, right? So that's where, the, where the, the, the funding schemes are a little bit harder. And then, of course, what you really need, a company to jump in and, and invest, right? Their own resource. But it's not, not, the, not the money necessarily, but the commitment to the product, right? And I think that's what, what we touched upon earlier. Yeah, so that's challenging. Are there any further questions from the audience? So I, I've got my own... Um, questions here, but I wanted to see whether there's anybody here we've got, here we go. Um, from an anonymous attendee, we've got, to measure the performance of the haptic teleoperation, do you think between qualitative and quantitative measurement, which one is the best representation for the clinician? That's actually a very good question. So basically, mm -hmm. in those type of interactions, in the assessment of these interactions, is the quality, how it feels, is it a better metric, in, you know, a, a more representative metric for the clinician than, than let's say, you know, path following errors or, or quantitative measurements, which of course, as engineers, we could make available to the clinician. I think it, it, it is, uh, I mean, you do both really. So you need to have some kind of, of course, ground truth where you know what kind, what is the actual level that it is there. And then you compare that with what is being perceived. But I think that this perceiving of haptic feedback is best done through some particular um, activity, if you like. So, so not just, a, um, you know, you repeat different levels and say, okay, do you feel this? But rather give them something where they have to detect some difference. Yeah. And I think through activity, uh, some particular action, you do that better than through just passive changes of, of, the, of the levels of haptic feedback. Because of course it also changes. So in, in, in your setup, the clinician would be, scrubbed or non-scrubbed so is it sort of da vinci style where they sit at a master and they are somehow detached from the surgical scene or is the idea for them to also be scrubbed and working with the patient i think they're scrubbed and they are there they are not detached from the patient i think that's the whole idea of the partly the idea of the wearable is that they get close to the patient that they don't need to be with so many people around so they maybe don't even need assistant surgeon um, and definitely they don't have to sit remotely if they don't want to. They could. I mean, we are looking at this now in uh, 5G, so uh, testing this now. So Sheffield has a 5G uh, facilities um, and looking at some of these haptic feedback, active constraints, 
And you know, the, do we actually have the 5G that affects um, or changes these uh, yeah. controllers? Yeah, I think the most interesting, time, interesting times we have had in a while. So the parting question for me is, having been in the field a long time as well, surgical robotics mainstream, short-term, mid-term, long-term, or never? So, so it's sort of like the never ending question. So when do you think we'll see surgical robots being more mainstream? So rather than niche, is it sort of a short-term thing? So we're almost there, you know, big companies acquisitions and so on is happening. Mid-term, long-term or, or in reality, sort of we're going to another low following the high. Yeah, well, it is a huge investment. I think we might see mid-term maybe coming from, I'm not sure if it, it will come from Europe or it will come from elsewhere. And by elsewhere, I think maybe China. Um, it is, it's, it's very expensive research and yeah. very expensive translation. And um, I don't know how, how Europe is ready and going into that direction. I see that we have slight change now also towards AI. Um, maybe not here, maybe somewhere else, but I think it's not, it's not long term. I think it is short to midterm. It's the most exciting the field has been, but the question is, will it carry that all the way to the Premier League or not? That's, <laughs> that's the question for tomorrow. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Question. Thank you for your attention. You know, thank the audience for your attention. Thank you for your contribution. Remind everyone that this talk will eventually make it to our YouTube channel, where those of us who are not here, able to do it live, can, can, can watch Sanya offline in their own time. And of course, remind everybody that everything that we will be doing for the symposium up until the end of July, which is the closing ceremony, will be available on or is available on the website at www.hamlinsymposium.org. So thank you, Sanya. Thank you, everybody. And I wish you a wonderful, warm rest of the day and see you soon. Thank you, Sanya. Thank you. Thank you Take all. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.